Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the Aspen Institute. Uh, I'm Dana Joya, the director of the Harmon Eisner Program in the Arts here at the Aspen Institute, and I'd like to thank you all for coming. One of the purposes of these roundtables in arts and culture is to give the uh, cultural community of Washington, the leaders of the arts and cultural programs, an opportunity to gather um, and to you know have a, you know a an extended conversation with a significant leader in American culture. Uh, I am delighted uh, today to, you know, have one of my favorite uh, critics, you know, tout court uh, in the United States, Paul Goldberger, uh, whom I'm sure is a person well known to everyone here. You have a biography of him on your seats, and so I don't want to over elaborate his extensive credentials, but I will give you a kind of thumbnail biography, uh, uh, you know, Mr. Goldberger was born the same year I was, 1950, ah, okay. uh, and so I feel year. a certain right. deep affinity, you know, for that mid-century moment. Uh, unfortunately, while I was, you know, still poking around in school, he graduated uh, Yale um, and had the good luck to miss out on a scholarship to Clare College uh, and was forced the indignity of, to go work at the New York Times. Uh, on the Sunday Magazine as an right. assistant writer. Uh, there came a moment in 1974 when the architect Louis Kahn had a, a sudden and tragic death where uh, Paul Goldberger wrote the obituary. Uh, I think it was the very next year that the Times made him their architecture right. critic. Uh, in, uh, at the age of 34, he won the Pulitzer Prize in criticism and a few years later became the architecture critic of The New Yorker, you know, where you know, he has been a voice which is uh, not simply uh, clear, compelling, and erudite, but as a writer, uh, you know, Paul Goldberger seems to me a, an extraordinary stylist. I mean, someone who can write about architecture in a way which has enormous personality and emotional impact. And I was, uh, having read him now for, you know, probably, you know, 32, 33 years when I came to New York, uh, when, I, when I read Why Architecture Matters, I was just profoundly struck by the, the lyricality of the book. This is a book that is an extraordinary introduction, really, to architecture. It gives you a historical sweep, uh, an aesthetic argument, but it is uh, a book that's suffused with personality, which really brings me to my first question. Uh, you know, uh, thank you, by the way, Dave. Uh, uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Which is uh, um, now you are, um, in some ways, a formalist. I mean, when you talk mm. about architecture, you talk about the design, the the it is an, an aesthetic and architectural object. Uh, and yet, when you do this, you always move beyond that. Uh, and inc what always has the sense in your work of a real human being looking at and moving through the building. Uh, so let me ask you a question about that person. Sure. sure. Uh, did you, as a you know, as a young boy, when everybody else wanted to be a spaceman, uh, you know, or a, a, a baseball player, did you want to be an architecture critic? No, well, when I was. How did you come to this when profession? When I was at the sort of I want to be a fireman or a baseball player stage, no. Um, I think I too wanted to be a baseball player. Um, it wasn't too long before I realized that uh, my odds for making the major leagues were not high. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, there, there, there are not a lot of Jewish kids from the suburbs who become Derek Jeter or something. <laughs> I mean, that just doesn't sort of happen very much. Um, I was always very interested in writing and journalism. Uh, I did, as a little kid, you know, edit my school paper and all that stuff that people do. And I had this funny interest in architecture that um, goes all the way back to when I built with blocks and drew pictures of houses and all, all that stuff. Uh, the thing that's always perplexed me is what instinct made me want to kind of find the point of intersection between those different yeah. worlds. Uh, and I didn't consciously set out to become an architecture critic, but I did feel that that was where these worlds that I, I liked and were interested in 
was interested in sort of crossed. And in fact, there was, this is a little embarrassing, but since we're uh, among friends, I can say it. Um, my, uh, when I was in high school, I was asked, as everyone always is, you know, what do you want to do or whatever, and I just sort of blithely said, because I knew it was where all the things that I was interested in sort of crossed, I just said, oh, I'd like to become architecture critic of the New York Times. And they put that in the yearbook, actually. <laughs> <laughs> At some point, I think when I was 40, a friend of mine dug that up and made a poster out of, out, out of it. Um, so it's a little bit embarrassing, actually, because I really didn't sit down and plot my life in some orderly way. I just sort of tossed that off as a joke. And then I was unbelievably lucky, and it sort of happened. But, um, you are an astonishingly quotable writer. I mean, when I was going through the book making uh, a little thing, every page I had these. And, and there's a, a, a statement that you make in, in several variations, uh, you know, that is, uh, that I want to ask you about, which is, this is, you know, you know, architecture is an art, but we cannot view it through an aesthetic lens, you say at one point. I, uh, and in another through, o through an only an aesthetic lens, yeah. I think I said. Okay, uh, I should have said. Yeah, I, well, didn't, I, I, I might have miscopied <laughs> it. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. down. But you, but you go. You know, uh, that you know, architecture always connects to something. It right. is never a thing unto itself. Right. Which is also, you know, when you begin with the object, uh, which is the it is an object of art. Right. Uh, what in writing these books did you try to connect well, architecture well, through? Which which you wouldn't normally see in, in books of architecture. Sure. Um, well, first, I do see architecture very much as experiential, more than theoretical. Uh, I'm very interested in how we experience buildings and what they feel like. Uh, but the point I was getting at in, in, in what you're asking about is, you know, you, you start with the building as an object. I mean, a building is a thing. It's bigger than a water bottle, but it is an, a physical object, and you have to start with that. But if you end with that, you have not really gotten into the reality of architecture. And architecture also relates to how people live, to, to sociology, to culture, to finance, to politics, to all of those things. And I, I try to relate to all of those things, to put it within the context of all of those things, but at the same time also not to lose uh, some sense of its objectness at the same time and to try to balance those things. I think, I think if you are, to, to really understand architecture and write about it and experience it fully and properly, I think you have to be one of those people who sees things multidimensionally just by their nature. If you think one th things are very simple and they're either this or that, uh, black or white, you probably will never get architecture because, in fact, the, the magic of architecture is that it is poised tantalizingly between all these different realms. I mean, yes, it's the real world, and yes, it depends on money and politics and zoning law and all this other stuff, but it also has all the, the power and beauty of aesthetics, of art. When it's working, it has all that. You, you've now published 16 books. I mean, you could have stopped with a sonnet on a bookshelf, you know, but, but with, these, with these last two books. How do you see your work changing as a writer across uh -huh. your career? Well, I don't think it's fundamentally changed in that I don't think I, you know, once thought uh, X and now I think Y or Z. But I hope it's gotten better. I hope it's gotten more perceptive. Um, I hope it's gotten tighter, and I hope it's gotten a little more self-assured. Um, actually, if I were going to, since these are very candid conversations, we can be a little bit confessional, uh, I think if my writing had any flaw early on, it was that it was almost too balanced. Mm. I mean, sometimes you can, you can be fair-minded and balanced to a fault and be a little too inclined to say, on the one hand this, on the other hand that. Um, I think really strong criticism, at the end of the day, brings you to a clear point of view and has the courage of its convictions, but is just based on a broad enough sensibility so it doesn't appear narrow, prejudiced, or um, to be jumping to a conclusion without building up evidence. And so you're moving from journalism, really, then, to, to criticism. Right. You right. seem very, very uh, aware of your precedents uh, mm -hmm. in criticism. I mean, all, all the way back to Vitruvius, 
you know, through John mm -hmm. Ruskin, you know, up through, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, do, you, do you see yourself, you know, in, in a sense, standing in a particular uh, lineage of critics? Uh, I would rather see my, I mean, Vitruvius, I don't want to uh, think about myself in terms of, uh, I mean, that, that's, that, you know, that, that would be asking you if you see yourself in the lineage of Shakespeare as a poet or something. I mean, I'm, I've, on one sense, of course, but in another way. Depends literally. how many drinks one's had. Right, exa exactly. But, it's, you know, it's only 12.25 in the afternoon, yeah. so we're, we're yeah. um, I do think uh, that I, I feel a lot of connections between myself and uh, a lot of critics of the last hundred years, say. Mm -hmm. um, which is not to suggest there's total agreement. Um, I have enormous admiration for Lewis Mumford, uh, whose position at the New Yorker I'm sort of very honored to hold. On the other hand, I don't know if there's anybody that I admire as much and disagree with as much as Lewis Mumford. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the ratio of admiration to agreement is kind of out of whack with him. Uh, but he was extraordinary. Um, and he uh, profoundly believed in and highly influenced me in the notion of architecture criticism as deeply connected to social responsibility yeah. uh, and not viewing a building purely as an aesthetic object. Um, Mumford's problem was that he, uh, I think he sometimes went a little too far away from aesthetics, yeah. A, and B, um, he really believed that the world was ultimately rational and perfectible and organizable and all that. And I tend to a much more Jane Jacobsian view of the city as not something that we can plan down to the nth degree, and in fact that the serendipity of it is part of its strength and its, yeah. its, its magic. There's an idea that runs through uh, why architecture matters. It's interesting. I, I try to give it a name. I ended up calling it civic existentialism. Ooh, you know, I like that. Okay. Which is that can we quote you in the second yeah. edition? Please. Sort of, okay. Uh, <laughs> and and, 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 and uh, once again, I may be paraphrasing it badly, but the notion that architecture in a city mm -hmm. over time either creates or fails to create the sense of an authentic and unique place. Mm -hmm. you know, and that this in some ways becomes you know, the, the sign of a great city, of a great neighborhood. Um, what's, you know, what cities do you think... Uh, you know, really embody that idea for you, and which which um, let's use American cities okay. here uh, fail to, or what neighborhoods, or what streets. Mm -hmm. um, you know, actually, it's at funny. one point, if you give this okay. great this great pan to Central Park West, you know, yeah. which I think anybody who walks down that street or stands on a balcony in that street feels. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot there's a lot of New York in this book, although I hope not too much, and it, I don't think it's completely New York centric at all. I mean, there's a, no. a lot of Washington, a lot of London, some Paris, some. Uh, Beijing, I mean, all, all kinds of places. Even the Royal Crescent of Bath. Yes, exactly. You read all the way to the end. I'm very grateful. Thank you. <laughs> um, the, uh, I am, it's a hard question to answer because I'm so fascinated by some places that I ultimately don't necessarily love, you know. I mean, I'm, uh, but if we're going to talk about places that have a powerful, cities that have a really powerful sense of place that are successful, as such, um, beyond New York uh, in this country. Um, I think Chicago is an extraordinary city, even though it has done a number of things wrong over the last few years. And uh, I think they're lucky they didn't get the Olympics, by the way, but that's another, a whole other discussion. Um, but um, I, am, I love Charleston very much. Um, I think New Orleans is another complicated story unto itself, but is uh, a city with a very powerful sense of place in this country. Um, so is Los Angeles, which is the uh, most complex city in America after New York, and uh, the one that has the most perplexing form of urbanism because it contradicts most conventional urban theory, which is that uh, urbanism is a product of density. Yeah. Uh, suddenly, in Los Angeles, you don't have that, and yet you have all of the cultural energy that you associate with old, older, tighter places like New York. Yeah. Um, that continues to fascinate me. Uh, I mean, I've, I've always been interested in cities, particularly American cities, 
even where they are not particularly appealing. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated by Houston, uh, even though I, at the end of the day, I don't really like it that yeah. much. Um, but uh, I love Pittsburgh, which has the greatest entrance of any city, definitely in America and maybe the world, actually, when you drive along that expressway yeah. and then you, you never see the city and it's hidden by the mountain and you go through the tunnel and then bam, you're on the bridge and you're in Pittsburgh. It's, it's unbelievably powerful. Um, there's no city I know that, that you enter with that amazing experience that, that knocks me out every time I go there. So, well, let me ask you then to take mm -hmm. yeah. this idea and move one step beyond architecture itself. Why, what do we get in a city, in a, in a nation, when we actually create an authentic place? Or what do we lose when we don't? When we don't. Um, is, it just, is it merely aesthetic, or is there some other, some deeper value that is embodied in that? Well, I think um, authenticity of place is very closely tied to authenticity of community. And it's very difficult to <coughs> create meaningful place without meaningful community. They go together. and. Uh, there are a number of forces in this country in the last uh, generation, say, that have made the creation of community very difficult. Um, and, you know, we inevitably now, in this conversation, I can feel us moving faster and faster toward a discussion of sprawl and yeah. larger urban planning and all of the costs of it, of which uh, certainly community and authenticity of place are a critical one. Um, but it's not quite so simple as that either, because you know, we tend to very easily uh, assume that, uh, well, all the complaints about, say, what's often called the monoculture today, everything becoming more and more the same. It is indeed becoming more and more the same, and that is indeed troubling. Uh, but it's not quite so easy as that, um, because it's not really true that, say, in the 19th century, everything was wonderful because every place was different. Um, you look at the uh, great buildings we admire, say, from the 1880s around this country. What was built in Boston, what was built in Washington, what was built even in Dallas or Minneapolis or Denver, were not that different, actually. They were really pretty much the same yeah, in true. some ways. Certainly the Romanesque Revival. You right, see that's the same exactly building. right. Romanesque Revival was very powerful, very successful, very wonderful, and it spread like wildfire through the country. And so how come that, time, that age that was supposed to be all about regional differences was doing all that stuff that was the same? Um, well, ultimately, it was a, there was something inherently just good about that stuff. And my point is that... Uh, we need not, we, we can't allow ourselves to be seduced by this notion of regional differences. Sometimes time is the most powerful shaper of place. Um, it's the same reason that, uh, you know, why are Houston and Los Angeles cities that are altogether different culturally and historically somewhat similar in form because they both really grew big in the 20th century. Um, whereas, you know, New York is largely a 19th century city. Uh, the older form of part of New York is more of an 18th century city, uh, as is downtown Boston. And so, the, you know, there, there are uh, similarities across time well, that, that ultimately mean a lot. Well, that, that leads so, to, yeah. I mean, the, the one, what's the thing, if I can quote it, just two questions you ask sure. uh, in this book, which really lead from that. And this really, this is, surprised me in a sense, and it really made me ponder, and you, you have two questions which you half answer and half don't in the book. I mean, I think, and it's towards the end, he goes, um, how much do cities mean in an age of cyberspace? Right. Uh, which is an issue about community. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. And then you said, and this is something which, which is a, a kind of fear I think some of us have, you know, quote, I am not sure that we any longer have the ability to create in a city as strong a sense of place as we once did. Mm -hmm. you know, That's kind of what I was getting at a moment ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Do you think we've passed some critical juncture in history where it's going to be all, you know, not, not all shopping malls and plazas, no, but no, it's but, not. Um, but that we we can't create whatever that human connectivity that great cities provide. I think we do still yearn for it. We want it. Um, you know, there were predictions in the '90s that the city was kind of finished. 
uh, I mean, when, when we first began to get heavily into the internet and all that it implied, uh, I remember in the, I think it was the mid-90s in Forbes of all places, there was a exchange between George Gilder and Tom Peters about the future of the city. And George Gilder said, oh, it's a tired, old, dirty, messy, dangerous, awful place. It's a relic of the industrial age. And one of the great things about technology is it will liberate us from the city and we can all, you know, go out and sit under a tree in a beautiful place and look out at a pond and work on our computers. Um, and Sounds very Gilder. Right. And Tom Peters said, not so quick now. You know, in fact, there is something about real human contact that um, the internet, no matter how sophisticated, is not going to provide. And he's actually sort of turned out to be right. I mean, in fact, the years almost immediately following that particular exchange in the 90s, uh, New York began to boom again tremendously. And while it, the bulk of that boom was driven by financial services, you know, there was also that sort of secondary industry that became known as Silicon Alley, the counterpart to Silicon Valley, huge amounts of tech businesses choosing to be in a conventional, traditional, dense urban area and becoming, in fact, a, a vehicle of revival for it. Um, we are not, you know, giving it up so quickly. Uh, its, it's nature has continued to transform as it always has and, and always will, I think. But, uh, there is something about real human contact that we instinctively crave. Yeah. Uh, and cities are made to serve that, basically. Well, I'm going to ask a couple uh, quick questions, and then we'll open it I up. I would also say, if I can just, one, one more yeah. quick point on that. Um, I think if there's anything the city provides that is unable to get any, you're unable to achieve anywhere else, it's actually not order, not things that we plan, but serendipity. It's the accidents that happen in the city, the unexpected encounters mm -hmm. that exist because of propinquity, yeah. uh, serendipity from propinquity. Um, <laughs> and uh, in that sense, you know, one might almost say that the city is, uh, for all its real time, real space, and linear physical quality, uh, is also not unlike the internet where hyperlinks create all kinds of unexpected connections jumping from one thing to another. Um, that's what happens in the city, in fact. Well, th um, that's the purpose of today, is really to have uh, propinquity for right. lunch. Right, um, there we are. Right. And, uh, yes. and conversation. Eating, eating propinquity is yeah. the best of all. Yeah. Um, you know, when you told me you had two books coming out, and, you, and, and there was, mm -hmm. and, I, and I, th I thought one would be less interesting than the other. I, mean, right. I thought maybe it would be a, a smaller book, a larger book. But Building Up and Tearing Down is an extraordinary book. I mean, I'd read m most of it because it's the pieces from The New Yorker. Right. Yeah. But uh, in this lovely format, there's almost an, a, a kind of architectural history of the last decade. And, uh, and it's extraordinary because you can sort of follow all kinds of developments uh, in both contemporary architecture and urban planning. And I wanted to ask you, because after New York, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, obviously, since these are from the New Yorker, you know, uh, occupy most of the pieces, Beijing is right. the city you write about uh, most often. Yeah. Give us your impression of how successful, unsuccessful, or mixed the redevelopment of Beijing has been. Uh, well, mixed at best, definitely. Um, I mean, they, uh, <coughs> the, what they did for the Olympics was extraordinary. But uh, at some level, it's actually not even relevant to the larger questions of that city and its ongoing life. In fact, actually, the bird's nest, the uh, Herzog and Demuron Stadium, uh, which is magnificent, uh, incredible, could not have been done anywhere else in the world. Uh, but the Chinese have no more idea what to do with it now than anyone else does. <laughs> and in fact, uh, the, the only difference is, you know, they can afford a billion dollar white elephant, uh, whereas we couldn't. But um, it, 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 these things are not having a great impact on the city. Uh, and they have relatively little uh, direct relevance to our lives because they are the products of, and here again, architecture and politics inevitably connect. They're the products of, you know, an autocratic, dictatorial society. Um, the new terminal at the Beijing airport designed by Norman Foster 
as the largest single airport terminal in the world. I think it's 120 gates. Uh, it is uh, actually quite magnificent and beautifully done. Uh, and from conception through design, through construction to opening, took under five years, um, which is a shorter time period than the length of the environmental review process for the new terminal at Heathrow in London. <laughs> so there you have all you need to know about the difference between democracy and autocracy and architecture. Um, at the peak of construction on the Beijing airport, um, there, the work crew numbered 50,000, uh, who were probably, over the course of a month, paid less than the cost of lunch today. I mean, it's sort of, you know. Yep. And so, I mean, it is, uh, and the Chinese knew, they're whatever else smart, that this was a moment in history that they had to seize, not just because of the visibility of the Olympics. It was something larger than that, really. It's a, a few years ago, they would not have had the technological expertise and political wherewithal to pull this off. Mm -hmm. But I think they're also aware, although they won't admit it, that a few years from now, they may no longer be able to afford it because that culture will ultimately have to move toward the demands of a middle class, uh, set of skilled workers. I mean, you can't, you can't, uh, how, whatever tactics they used to get 50,000 people to build that airport and uh, pay them almost nothing so that they could build that airport quickly, and uh, they will not be able to do, sustain that forever. I mean, as they move more into the uh, economy of the rest of the world and as they become more subject to the social forces that go along with that economy, uh, they, they'll be less able to do that kind of thing. And so I think they, they knew that, although, again, as I said, they will never admit it. And so um, they seized this moment. Uh, what does it say about cities in general? Beijing, is a, as a city, is, you know, uh, they're beginning to do a little bit better, but basically it has, uh, other than some of these great architectural monuments that have been erected, it makes Houston seem like the paragon of rational planning. I mean, it's just sort of a, you know, it's just been a sprawling, traffic-filled, polluted disaster, most yeah. of it. Yeah. So, um, uh, two more questions. Uh, if you write about New York and Beijing the most, uh, there's a lot of cities you simply, you know, you write about significantly less, one of which is Washington, D.C., which mm -hmm. gets about the same coverage as uh, Perrysville, Missouri. Oh, my. Uh, you know, <laughs> no, it's uh, a little more. It's well, no, it's more. the same. They each get one piece uh, okay. in, the, in, you know, in, in the book. Now, the... But I want to... Okay, okay. There's a lot more Washington in the other book, though. Yeah. But, you know, but mm -hmm. I, what I, I wanted to ask is, what is your impression uh, in Washington of, of, the, of contem the contemporary ar architecture in the city? Okay, um, <laughs> not so high. Um, there is some. There's always been some. Um, it's always been fairly conservative uh, and limited. Uh, there is not a lot of great contemporary architecture in this city. You know, uh, 30 years ago, when I.M. Pei's National Gallery, East Building of the National Gallery was finished, it was widely hailed as you know, the, one of the great modern buildings of our time and so forth and so on. Um, I mean, it's a very beautiful building, but in fact, it was a very conservative building when it was built. Architecture kind of moved beyond that already, and it, I think they got away with building it here in part because it did represent something yeah. relatively conservative uh, at, its, at its time. Um, Washington has thus far avoided uh, being on the cutting edge of architecture quite successfully for <laughs> 300 years now. Um, that's not the worst thing in the world. You know, I mean, yeah. there's an awful lot of really good not cutting edge architecture here. And in fact, one of the things that I say uh, in Why Architecture Matters, there's a lengthy discussion of 
the Lincoln Memorial and another lengthy discussion of the West Building of the National Gallery, um, both, both of which I consider among the greatest buildings of the 20th century and among the more creative and imaginative buildings of the 20th century that are often misunderstood as just copies of something classical. In yeah. fact, there is an enormous amount of brilliant creative imagination in both of those buildings. Yeah. So that Washington is not on the cutting edge in other ways, I, um, it's true, but on the other hand, it's... It's D, it, that's sort of not in its DNA particularly. <laughs> and one of the other things we're talking about is a spirit of a place. And so I don't know that trying to make Washington something it isn't is necessarily that successful a pursuit. Um, and it's certainly doing, like a lot of cities, doing better in a more general way. Uh, I mean, the, uh, it's not even new anymore now. It's been there a while. The, the uh, terminal at National Airport is, you know, better than the average in this country still and you know pretty nice yep. and so you know there are a number of things in that category in Washington now and there will continue to be I hope. Before I turn uh, the questions over to the audience I want to ask one larger question which is you know if you could um, make a general statement of what what changes would you like to see happen in American architecture or American city planning uh, you know, from a, you know, from, you know, from, you know, a, a, an Olympian perspective, you know, well, what advice would you offer? Uh, um, I think we are far too. Uh, I mean, I'll tell you, I'll tell you something that, that, that's, that's essentially unachievable, but I think it's very important and again shows the connection between architecture and politics and other things. Uh, I think our cities are deeply damaged by uh, ill-conceived political barriers that ultimately control the planning process more than anything any planner might do. Um, I mean, if you think about a city, uh, I have to go to Hartford later this week. I was thinking about Hartford a little bit. You know, like a number of American cities, and Detroit is even a even stronger example, the political borders are written, they're, they're done almost like a gerrymandered congressional district to uh, cut out any, anybody with any money and keep in all the poor people. Um, and there is no real sense of a place with the means to control its own destiny. Uh, our inability to think in a more holistic regional way is a key problem. We have had a whole system of incentives for um, emptying out the center city yeah. and de-densifying it and sprawling around the region, which has been damaging ecologically, politically, and urbanistically all at once. Um, beginning to reverse that, I think, is, very, is a key, key thing. There's a lot of stuff in the book about uh, the whole relation of time to architecture, both in terms of personal memory and the larger sense of time in terms of cultural evolution yep. and, and all of that, um, which are different things. They're different enough so they're two different chapters, actually. And um, I, I think we're beginning to be more sensitive to that than we used to be. Uh, certainly, uh, we are much more attuned to preservation than we used to be as a culture, um, but we still have far to go. Um, and because you, you, I mean, yeah. you very much see architecture as part of a dialectic between the generations, the really, yes, generations, yes, and, sure. and the inhabitants of a city, absolutely, and that this, there's a psychic balance and, and sense of continuity that's created in a successful city. It's a way in which generations communicate with I mean, each other, as all culture is. Yeah, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, certainly. Yeah, yeah. The, I mean, two, I mean, the, the book is good from start to finish, but the most surprising chapters are that architecture in time, architecture in memory. Yes. You know, which right, are almost, right. you know, yeah, that's what I think about the lyrical meditations on the role Thank of architecture you. in human life and in civic life. Well, to, to hear that from a poet is very gratifying. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You're very welcome. Well, <laughs> I, I, I would guess that this audience has a number of questions of their own. Do we, is it roving microphones today? Yeah, so if you have a question, raise your hand and we will eventually, you know, I will, uh, do you want me to call on them? It's up to you. No, you, you let, you know, Tarek, why don't you make the calls because it's, you know. Um, yeah. 
I'm curious to um, have your perspective on the future of art art critici architecture criticism mm -hmm. in newspaper print and its relationship to web media as we look at a wave of retirements sure. across the country and um, it becoming harder and harder to see a critical voice in, in newsprint. Well, uh, the question of architecture criticism in print is a serious one. It's, it's inevitably connected to the question of print period, of course. I mean, as, as print, particularly print through newspapers, becomes more and more problematic, um, newspaper, I mean, architecture criticism is, you know, but a minor functionary in that larger and rather tragic decline. Uh, but yes, you're right. Um, I do worry. Uh, it's paradoxical because we're at a time when I think there's greater public interest in architecture as a civic and cultural, as a central part of the civic dialogue and cultural dialogue than there ever has been, but less guidance as newspapers either disappear altogether or cut out things that they consider not as central to their function as Dear Abby or whatever, and so therefore they don't do architecture. Um, the, as in every field, uh, the web is picking up some of the slack, but we're at a point where it's all still very much finding itself. Um, there's a zillion architecture blogs out there. Um, I have to tell you that I try to follow them somewhat. Um, I cannot follow all of them because if I did, I would need an assistant who was the blog reader or something, and, and because there's so much. And most of it isn't really very good. Um, I mean, my problem with a lot of what goes on in the blogosphere, uh, and by that I mean not only actual uh, standalone blogs, but you know the comments that are now de rigueur in the New York Times website and everywhere else, isn't that it's full of horrible, vile, disgusting things that people shouldn't be saying. It's that most of it is just sort of boring and so what? I mean, that's all. You know, and, and, um, it, uh, there just isn't that much interesting that's being said there. And uh, in the same way that you know, it's just not terribly interesting to know that somebody sneezed one day. I mean, I don't have to announce it to the world. Um, there's a lot of that. I'm hoping that will kind of shake itself down over time in not just architecture, but in every realm. And it'll begin to focus more. Uh, I mean, the, the important thing that uh, great journals, magazines, newspapers have always done is provide an editing feature for all of us. And by that, I mean much more, much more than the literal editing a copy editor does. I mean that they are conceptually editing the world and presenting it to us in a managed format that we trust. Um, right now, we don't have that in the blogosphere. It will ultimately have to shake itself down toward that because none of us can spend all day just sort of sifting through the internet. So, yeah. Um, Hi. Uh, okay. uh, could you address the condition of the General Service Administration's excellence in architecture program and maybe pick a couple things that the Obama administration could do uh, to help us toward a more progressive, uh, architecturally progressive or planning progressive federal government? Right. It's a good question, actually. Um, the design excellence program in the GSA, I think, has actually a pretty impressive record. Um, it has done some remarkable things against all odds. Um, and while everything it has produced is hardly a masterwork, it has raised the floor considerably and raised the average considerably. And since I believe you can take the measure of a time as much by where its center is than where its uh, advanced guard is, it's, it's, it's pretty good. Um, I am not actually familiar with where it's gone in the last year under the current administration and whether they are prepared to invest in its ongoing, not only its continuation, but its expansion and enhancement. Um, I'm worried that it may be mistakenly considered a frill that can be 
uh, dropped in times of economic pressure. Uh, and I hope that those in charge of the program will be able to make the case that, in fact, long term it provides value, not added cost, but greater long term value. Uh, the, you know, this is an administration that I think shows every sign of possessing enormous sophistication culturally, but it has not yet demonstrated uh, so in the realm of architecture. Neither has it demonstrated anything contrary to that position. It just simply, you know, it has sort of, I think architecture has yet to really move onto the radar screen of this administration in a, in a noticeable way. Um, I will say, and this is not the GSA, but, uh, um, and not the Design Excellence Program, but another realm that I've, I've watched a little bit more closely lately, um, one way in which the administration could make a tremendous mark would be in trying to get some sanity into the process of designing embassies and make them look a little bit less like bunkers and recognize that, in fact, we can ultimately show a better face to the world by showing our best than showing our, you know, showing that we know how to make something secure. Um, and uh, we have had our prior, not that security is not itself obviously essential, but we have been a little confused in our priorities and how we have um, presented ourselves to the world in the last decade at least. And there's an area in which I think uh, the administration could make a significant mark, and I hope it will. So, um, yeah. Hi, Paul. Um, is there, why should uh, President Obama be happy that he didn't get the Olympics? Is, ah, it, is it I didn't, because well, of the White Elephant um, Stadium that might be built? Why should President, well, I don't know that President Obama will be happy that he didn't get the Olympics, and I know that Mayor Daley is not happy he didn't get the Olympics, but I said I was happy <laughs> because um, I, I, I just think inevitably it will be vastly more expensive, vastly more politically disruptive than expected, um, and I don't think they can afford it, that's all. I think that um, in London, uh, they're kind of going crazy over 2012 now because they can't really afford it. Uh, they're not the Chinese. They have, they're dealing with the demands to create an enormous number of expensive facilities under tremendous time pressure at a time when their own economy is stressed and the pound is in bad shape. Um, and, you know, in New York I hear general sighs of relief that that our 2012 bid was ultimately not successful. There are a lot of people who, you know, maybe it's just as well, all things considered. Um, and I don't think Chicago needs to be put on the world map. It's really there more than it thinks it is. Now, that's all. On the other hand, you know, if, if it had happened, I think they would have been okay, and I don't think it wouldn't have destroyed the city. I think it just would have stressed the city, both politically and economically, in a way that wasn't necessary. Um, in Chicago, by the way, the um, uh, mayor is so uh, unhappy about having lost the Olympics that they seem to be going ahead with at least a couple of projects, one of which involves demolishing a rather nice uh, campus of hospital buildings designed by Walter Gropius that were to have been the Olympic Village that he's demolishing anyway, just on principle. <laughs> so <laughs> figuring he'll, he'll turn it into a development site or something. And it, yes, yes, it, it, it sort of almost, you feel like this is sort of, I'll show you. Uh, I'll show you. <laughs> but, um, building up and tearing down. Right, building up and tearing down, <laughs> yes. Uh, so, uh, but uh, you know, if, if it had, it would have been made to work some way or another. I just think it, it, it is creating a degree of stress on the, um, both political fabric and certainly economic fabric of London that I'm not sure will produce commensurate benefits in the end, although who knows. Um, so. There was uh, some controversy recently here over the design, the architect chosen for the new African American History Museum. 
and some thought that Diller Scofido or Diller the guys who, yeah, who yes, did the right. Lincoln Center. Right. And I just wonder, what are your thoughts on uh, design competitions, and have you experienced that as a jury member? Are, are they trying for political correctness, or how much has politics become involved in that? That's an interesting question. Oh, there's always politics, of course. Um, design competitions are potentially a wonderful mechanism to, you know, achieve, to particularly to bring new people into the fold. Uh, and Washington has one of the greatest examples in modern American history of a positive result from such, which is the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Maya Lin, uh, which could never have happened but through a competition. Uh, on the other hand, they also add enormous complexity, cost, and delay to a project. And we tend in this country to be n far more nervous about them than the Europeans and, uh, and far more hesitant to let our put our trust in the competition process for large public buildings. So we really don't do it as, as often as we might. Um, what we do do often are not real competitions, sort of limited competitions or whatever, where a few people are invited to do designs and paid a little bit of money and then they choose. Um, you know, it, it offers some benefits but also other liabilities because the reality is an architect can only create a really successful design out of dialogue with a client. And in that process, you don't have dialogue. You know, you have dialogue after, but you've got to pick. And there's always the risk that, a pro that, that the competition process becomes a beauty contest. You know, um, I mean, I, while Norman Foster is, I think, a very gifted architect who runs a, a, an impressive firm, He's won an un disproportionate number of competitions because he does the most dazzling models you've ever seen in your life. And so <laughs> it's sort of, you know, um, and that sort of knocks people's eye out. And so, I mean, that is a risk in the competition process. Uh, you're right, right. He, he, did, he didn't lose this one, that's true. Well, um, now, you asked about political correctness. Uh, there is, whether within the competition process or outside of it, there is often pressure today. Uh, to have an architect who, let us say, shares certain uh, ethnic connections with the subject matter of a building. Um, I, I, I think it, that's unfortunate. Uh, it's understandable, particularly in the climate in which we live today, but it's unfortunate. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I'm giving a talk in a couple weeks at um, Beth Shalom Synagogue outside of Philadelphia, which is the only synagogue Frank Lloyd Wright ever designed, and it's their 50th anniversary, so it's marked their 50th birthday. And um, I look back at some of the history of it, and there are all these documents and letters uh, in which people are questioning uh, whether they should be hiring this guy Frank Lloyd Wright to design their synagogue, because, you know, he's not Jewish. And so, is this right? And so, we're, and going back and forth, and the rabbi, who was a great promoter of it, was steadfast and, and uh, said, uh, absolutely, and in fact, then claimed to have consulted various um, ancient documents and determined that the designer, of, <laughs> the designer of King Solomon's temple was not Jewish either. So therefore, there was, there was precedent. So, uh, in any, uh, you know, who, who will respond best to the programs and demands of a situation uh, is not a direct function of their own ethnic background. I mean, I know that was very much front and center in Washington a few years ago when the Indian Museum, the Native American Museum, was happening. And, uh, you know, to uh, um, mixed results, let's say. Um, so. Um. Hi, I'm Paris Glendinning, the uh, president of Smart Growth Leadership Institute. I want to follow up just a moment on your earlier question yeah. or earlier comments about the Obama administration. Um, they have uh, articulated an interesting policy, I think, where uh, first of all, the various agencies are asked to focus on a much more regional basis, and secondly, with regard to their sustainable community partnership, they're asking that policies and programs, uh, not just federal buildings, but uh, broad programs, be very specifically directed at uh, impact uh, on place and mm -hmm. place in a, in a regional uh, context. Uh, my impression is that this is a rather innovative uh, thinking for a national administration and over the long run 
uh, could have a very significant impact on what is going on in many of the areas, addressing some of the issues that you've raised in your various writings over the years. And I was wondering uh, about your thoughts on, on their initiatives in those two areas, the regional uh, as well as directing uh, other departments uh, to focus on place. Uh, the short answer is yes. I mean, all, all for it. Um, I think an understanding of place uh, and the very use of the word place in the vocabulary, I think, is itself, uh, even though it may seem a little glib, is a positive thing. I think it, we, there's a far greater understanding of, uh, as we were talking earlier, of the, the sort of nature of place as a, as a thing, as, a, not, as a, both a physical construct and a sort of state of, state of mind and, and cultural construct um, that emerges in part out of a lot of very good things the NEA has been doing over the years, in part out of uh, the National Trust and a lot of its programs and Main Street program has sort of reinforced sense of place in a, in a broad way. It's become part of the cultural conversation and it would be uh, troubling if the federal government were not in fact encouraging it and supporting it. Um, the uh, regional uh, emphasis uh, may or may not ultimately create a greater sense of regional distinction. Um, and again, as I said earlier, while I, I desperately want places to not be like all other places, I also feel we, we uh, can't retreat instantly into a kind of glib cliche there, and we do, it behooves us to remember that even in the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries, there were uh, more similarities than we sometimes admit uh, across geography within a certain time period. Um, but that said, of course, anything we can do to enhance uh, different regional sensibility is the better. My sense, by the way, is that the uh, regional emphasis may have more impact on, in just a purely administrative way, that it's a better way to run the agency, perhaps, because it is uh, um, decentralizing authority a little bit more um, than on the specifics of the programs. Now, the final uh, point of your question involving sustainability, um, which is something I, it's interesting, I have not talked about that much now, and uh, I don't talk about that much in the book, um, mainly because, not because I have, heaven knows, any difference with it. But I just think we, have, we are rapidly getting to, if we have not already arrived, at a point when sustainability has become um, a given, as it should. And it was for a, an architect to incorporate sustainable features in a building is now almost like saying, gee, would you mind putting electricity and running water in your building? I mean, it's just considered a given. It is part of the... Uh, set of expected things in a building. We're not quite as far as running water yet, but, you, you, but uh, we're, we're going there very quickly. And I also, I'll, I'll digress for one second, answer a question you didn't ask, uh, which is about the impact of sustainability on the physical appearance of on architecture itself, uh, which I suspect is going to be a little less than people think, not because we will be less interested in sustainability, but because we're making so much progress so fast in uh, changing and improving the nature of building materials and things like that so that uh, buildings can be more sustainable when they don't necessarily look as different as they did. Uh, the obvious case in point is uh, when people first started talking about energy and architecture in the 70s and early 80s, there was lots of sort of hue and cry about how it would be the end of glass buildings. because. Well, we now have more glass buildings than ever, and the reason is because glass manufacturers figured out how to make glass perform very, very differently under, uh, in the real world of energy conservation and sustainability. And so glass saved itself by changing itself. Uh, the buildings did not dramatically change their appearance. Um, not to say that they will not continue to evolve, but we will not see two whole different categories of architecture, sustainable and non-sustainable. Um, 
Thank you very much. I have a, a China question. We okay. um, at Meridian International Center up the street, we, we recently uh, curated an exhibit of contemporary art from Beijing with mm -hmm. the, uh, the director of the National Art Museum there. And one of the things that came up, and it was about globalization and urbanization, uh, there is a, a very serious core of artists you know, in you know, urban areas in Beijing and Shanghai, right. but right. around the country, that are addressing this lacuna that you're both talking about, sort of that lack of place and that lack of continuity mm -hmm. across mm -hmm. generations. Mm -hmm. And the question of this is twofold. One is China as an emergent or an emerged economy, is that an inexorable process that, is, that societies go through, that they, they reinvent the wheel, that nobody's looking at what we did 30 years ago and saying, whoops, let's not do that, what the Americans did? Or is there a way that that can be circumvented in some way? You know, or each, is each society necessarily going to do this over and over ad infinitum you know, into the future? Uh, I don't know that I want to talk about all societies in all times. This, is, uh, this conversation's a little more cosmic than it needs to, <laughs> needs to be already, I think. But I will say that it is astonishing to see the extent to which the Chinese have been replicating many of our mistakes. Yes, that, that much I will say. I continue to be amazed at how they have chosen not to learn from the lessons that our evidence should be teaching them. Uh, and uh, maybe they're beginning to when the world is putting more pressure on them to do so, but, uh, and I think the process of learning has accelerated somewhat. So they will not go all the way. I mean, they're building more mass transit in Beijing now, for example. I mean, they are, and uh, they're not putting their faith entirely in expressways. But yes, they are, uh, um, I mean, the, the irony of, of Beijing becoming more filled with cars and fewer and fewer bicycles when the West is desperately trying to do exactly the opposite <laughs> is, is, is remarkable, in fact, to, to observe. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to extrapolate from that a theory of general societies, but it is absolutely true that that is happening in this case. Yeah. Does the United States yeah. have a role in this in terms of explaining our mistakes? Um, well, we so. could have a role in terms of explaining our mistakes. Um, it, that requires two things. We have to be willing to admit our mistakes, and the Chinese have to be willing to listen. <laughs> and I'm not entirely sure how likely either side of that conversation is to, to have its... Uh, so, by the way, one thing you mentioned uh, in terms of uh, artists in Beijing, um, it is remarkable to see the uh, strength of the contemporary art scene in Beijing uh, is extraordinary. Uh, and also the way in which uh, cultural energy in China has migrated toward Beijing and not Shanghai, which might have been expected, um, is itself fascinating. I mean, I, I think uh, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, um, it seemed as if Shanghai would be that, and, it is, and Beijing was going to be a kind of dull, uh, bureaucratic capital city. Um, in fact, what's happened is uh, Beijing has kind of become more like Berlin in a certain way, and Shanghai has become almost more like Frankfurt, actually, rather more, more, more uh, unidimensional, in fact, uh, culturally. It, it, it's, Fascinating and surprising. Oh, hi, um, I've, I've worked for a long time in a, in, a, in a sort of a tubby spaceship of a building on the National Mall, which um, I don't think you like very much, um, how it looked on the outside, which was the Hirschhorn. But um, I just wanted, it tubby actually brings up an issue. Tubby spaceship is actually one of the, one of the uh, more uh, graceful things that it could be described <laughs> as, actually, yeah. I would well, say. It is. I yeah, mean, you know, I mean, bored, dead, drop dead, neo penitentiary, right, modern, right, right, what's right. the word? Anyway, um, but my, it brings up an issue for me because I, I worked there for a really long time, and I kind of agree. I mean, it was a very peculiar-looking building, right. but um, I ultimately came to the conclusion, I think a lot of the people that worked there, and a lot of the public, too, that it works very well as an art museum, that it kind of propels you th very gracefully through spaces where you can look at art mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. nicely. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, I guess, you know, the relationship between the signal that a building sends out to the public and sort of what you actually will experience when you're inside of it. I mean, how do you see that kind of working? That's a very, uh, that's a very interesting way in which to phrase a question. Uh, and not one that can be answered quickly and we don't have that much time. 
and I could say, I suppose, that I try to answer it in the book. But let me, let me try to sort of answer it very, very concisely now, too. Um, yes, the Hirschhorn uh, in some ways works better than it might, you might anticipate or than its signals might suggest. Um, that's true. I also think, and I do talk about this in the book, that we have a way of ultimately getting used to things over time and making a peace with them because a building that you don't particularly like uh, you have to see all the time anyway. Uh, whereas, you know, a piece of music that you don't like, you can turn off. Um, you're not forced to hear it over and over again. But so that w I think we inherently adjust ourselves and kind of tune them out slightly because we need that to be able to go on living with them. Um, I think it's not possible to generalize on the bigger question of whether the signal of a building does or does not contradict what's inside. Absolutely, that sometimes happens. Um, but sometimes it doesn't. Um, and it sometimes happens in, in inverse ways to what you're describing. In fact, I think the um, East Building of the National Gallery sends a signal that's quite opposite of the Hirshhorn. It's quite inviting and exciting and energizing and pulls you in and all that. Um, and the public space, unlike the Hirshhorn, is exhilarating. But then, in fact, when you actually get into where you're looking at the art, it's a complete letdown. Yeah. And yeah. it's an afterthought. Whereas at the Hirshhorn, at least the spaces for the showing of art are the primary raison d'etre of the building's form. Uh, one has to grant it at least that. Um, so every situation is a little bit different, I would say. Well, uh, Paul, I think we should probably wrap up here because, I, you know, uh, we're getting towards the end of time. Uh, do you want to take one more question? Yeah, we'll take one more. I think the, the lady in the back is, is, has had her hand up for a long time, so we'll end with her. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we know, I'm Stephanie Bothwell. I'm on the board for the Congress for New Urbanism. And um, we know that it's very important for our cities to have extraordinary, iconic buildings. Um, and there are, there's a special role for the Starkitects. And we know that it's, but that the majority of the buildings that we see are done by our fabric buildings done mm -hmm. by production home builders, et cetera. My question to you is how can our institutions, whether we're in smart growth or sustainability or new urbanism, um, approach academia in a way that helps us to produce better urbanism and better architecture? Well, I think you've just actually answered it in part by the way you posed the question. Um, yes, we need a mix of um, foreground buildings and background buildings, and they serve different purposes. Uh, and I think we need to educate both the public and architects themselves on the importance of both and the need to do both. Uh, we, uh, and that is also part of the cultural shift we've been undergoing. Uh, you know, the rise of architecture within the culture to become a bigger subject than it once was um, is, I feel sometimes it's like that, I, 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 it makes me think of that line about, you know, uh, beware of what you wish for. <laughs> because, of course, as an architecture critic, that's all I ever wanted. Now we have it, but of course nothing is free. And one of the prices we pay is, in fact, a greater obsession with the star architect and the celebrity architect and the fancy building and so forth sometimes to the detriment of the larger urban fabric. It's absolutely true, and it is part of the price we're paying. Um, I can say only that I hope what I write and what I, uh, argues against that a certain amount. Um, I've tried very hard to not write architecture criticism that is simply a review of one star building after another. Uh, we ignore a lot of them, in fact. Um, and to try to make these points as often as possible. I think the greatest architectural challenge of modern times has been not to create great individual buildings, which we're very good at, but to create an urban fabric that is contemporary, that is as good as the urban fabric that was given to us by the 18th and 19th centuries. And, uh, and to do it without imitating those directly. Um, we have not yet solved that problem. I mean, the, the problem of, for want of a better term, of a modern vernacular. Um, 
we still haven't figured out how to do it yet. We've been struggling for a long time, and uh, you know, uh, certainly orthodox modernism and does not give us that. Mies and Gropius and the Bauhaus does not give us that. Neither did Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, neither has any real modernist model yet. Um, that's the great challenge looking forward. So there we are. Well, Paul Goldberg, thank you for joining thank us you. in conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. There, um, thank you. Thank you. there are, are copies of both books for sale out in the lobby, and Mr. Goldberger will be out there to sign them for you.